We'll take this issue up now with our panel. We have Malcolm Davis from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and Michael Danby, a former Labor parliamentarian. Gentlemen, it's an honour to have you both on the program. Michael, Evening, should Amanda. Australians serve as judges hello, on Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal, given the crackdown on civil liberties and concerns that exist about the rule of law in that nation? Very good to focus on this issue that has been too little focused on by uh, Australian media. I think uh, His Honour uh, Jim Spiegelman's decision in September 2020 shows the way. I understand that all UK judges have resigned from the final court of appeal and um, judges uh, Gummo, French um, and um, Keane should, uh, I think, consider their positions. It's difficult to believe that uh, judges so intelligent and experienced would be so naive as to, to stay on. I think it does give um, uh, the government in Beijing cover to uh, have these experienced former Australian High Court judges there um, with that terrible system they have now. Malcolm, last week we learned that the US had shot down a spy balloon the size of two buses. Today we learned that Canada has shot down a suspicious balloon the size of a car of presently unidentifiable origin. What does this mean for the relationships between China and the West going into the future? Well, look, uh, in addition to those two incidents, I'd add the one over Alaska, uh, where a US fighter aircraft also shot down a similar, uh, similar object to the one that was shot down over Canada. So that we're talking about three incidents in the last week or so. And I think what it suggests is that we're at a nadir in terms of the relationship between China and the West. China is clearly flexing its muscles, sending that spy balloon over the US earlier was a very provocative act on the part of Beijing. Uh, and these two most recent incidents tend to reinforce the suggestion that China is trying to probe US airspace, challenge US security, and indeed there'd be no reason why they couldn't do something similar to Australia. It's really troubling. Um, Michael, you know how important Australia's trade relationship is with China, but so too, indeed more important, is Australia's sovereignty. How do we reconcile these two considerations, given that they so often seem to come into conflict? Well, we've shown the way. We keep our nerve. Uh, we don't uh, compromise on the 14 demands that uh, the authorities in Beijing demanded of us to change our democratic system. Um, and we seek alternatives uh, uh, to our coal, wine, barley, and lobster exports, and they're, they're growing great, great guns. I must say, um, it's good to see cheaper lobsters in the South Melbourne market, but the, the main point is we can diversify, um, we shouldn't um, hedge on our democratic values, and we've shown that it can work. Now uh, Beijing is coming to us, uh, and good luck to Don Farrell negotiating further with them, but we haven't compromised and they're starting to buy our coal. So uh, Australia's shown the world the way with... Uh, facing down China. Yeah, good point, Michael. And um, the good work that was done during the coalition years to diversify those markets is something that, um, you know, if anyone in Labor can do it, I think Don Farrell's probably the guy. Um, Malcolm, there are cultural differences between the way that the Chinese see the world, you know, a really long view spanning generations. While here we seem so often locked into a short-term policy perspective that so often has an eye to the three years between elections. How can we ensure that Australian security and supply chain resilience um, is there when there seems to be a lack of that long-sightedness? Look, I think um, the sort of the short-term perspective on this occasion uh, is, is a good thing because the threats that we're facing are short-term threats. Uh, we're not talking about something that's going to happen to us in 20 or 30 years' time. We're talking about the potential for... Uh, war occurring potentially between China and the United States over Taiwan in the second half of this decade. So we do need to be thinking short term in some respects in terms of defence and national security. We can't afford to basically take our eye off the situation in regards to Taiwan. Uh, but at the same time, we do need to recognise that, as you say, China has a long term strategy. 
their goal is to reassert themselves as the new middle kingdom for the 21st century, to impose a Chinese-led sphere of influence on the Indo-Pacific and to exclude the United States. And in that future, it would be very dark indeed for Australia. Uh, your other guest talked about the list of 14 demands. Well, that list would be the first of many such lists if China were to succeed in controlling and dominating the Indo-Pacific. So we do need to think both short-term in terms of the national and security and defence risks and long-term in terms of the strategic and geopolitical challenges. Yeah, well said, although I think in Australia to have a 10-year view would be actually an improvement. Sometimes I think the Australian short-sightedness is in, you know, <laughs> two or three-year cycles. Um, Michael, Adam Crichton has written a piece in this weekend's Australian about the difficulties that the Five Eyes nations will face in keeping its edge in the security and defence space. What do you think is necessary for Australia to stay ahead of the game in this space so that it doesn't invite espionage, the exploitation of technology or other aggression that seems to come with the smell of weakness? Well, I think we have to do uh, what Richard Miles has done this week in response to James Patterson, act in a non-partisan way um, with Chinese technologies that were ex uh, intruded into Australia in an earlier naive period. We have to get rid of them um, and we have to continue uh, this fantastic cooperation that started between Japan, the United States, India and us um, in cyber, um, in defence cooperation, uh, in advanced technologies. Um, I'm sorry to say it, but the old formulation with uh, the Americans, whatever we think of uh, Biden or a Republican president, cling close to the American skirts. They've got the most advanced technology. Um, we've seen it with semiconductors. The Chinese are now falling behind them because they've uh, uh, banned the export of advanced American semiconductors. Um, that's what we have to do. Keep doing what we're doing. And this defence review had better get things right um, this, uh, this February with the acquiring of uh, new advanced uh, weapons and technologies that will enable us to stand off any uh, future military threat f from China. Thank you, Malcolm Davis and Michael Danby. I really appreciate your expertise.